Hey there, Coleman. How you doing? Doing pretty well, Glenn. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. This is Glenn Lowry, the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. I'm a professor at Brown University. I'm with the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, which sponsors the Glenn Show. And I'm with Coleman Hughes, um, who is a student at Columbia University and who writes now for- Now a graduate, actually. Boom. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Who is a former student at Columbia University, now a graduate of Columbia University, a BA in philosophy? Correct. Uh, and writes for Quillette uh, Magazine, amongst, uh, dot com, amongst other sources, and uh, has been a frequent guest on The Glenn Show in the past, and he's back. Good to see actually, you. Actually, I must announce now, I'm no longer writing for Quillette. I'm now writing for City Journal. Oh, now, does that mean that you have an exclusive deal with City Journal that prevents you from writing for Quillette, or have you broken with Quillette for some reason? Or, or no, I'm t I love Quillette and plan to write for them more in the near future. So I, I don't have an exclusive deal, but my primary affiliation is with City Journal now. Now, that sounds like another congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> City Journal, Manhattan Institute, New York City. They're conservative, Coleman, last time I heard. They are, unapologetically. <laughs> and you're unapologetically affiliated. Yep. I don't, I don't, I would never half affiliate with a place you either do or you don't, okay. in my opinion. How did that come about? I'm curious. They approach you or what? I've written for them a few times, and I know Brian Anderson, who runs City Journal there. Uh, but the reason, the main reason I came on is because Raihan Salam, who used to be at National Review and has written for, for The Atlantic as well, became the um, president. president of Manhattan Institute. And... I had known Raihan separately, so when he came to the came to MI, he strongly urged me to to get on board. And you know, after after uh, you know many conversations with him, uh, I came on. Yeah, I know Raihan too. I think the world of him actually. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited to see how Manhattan Institute uh, evolves under his leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on, just a minute, Lawan. Would you like to come here and say hello to Coleman? My wife, everybody uh, wants to say hello to Coleman. I don't know why, maybe because he's younger and better looking than I am, but uh, <laughs> I want to say case, hello to her. <laughs> she wants, he wants to say hello to you. So here she comes. Brace yourselves, <laughs> audience. Mrs. Lawan Lowry. <laughs> hello, Coleman, how hello. are you? Your hair looks very nice, very different than last time I saw it. <laughs> Thank you. I've, I've uh, decided to reckon with my curly curlies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like how my mother's hair was. It's great. Uh, thanks. <laughs> how are you? I'm doing okay. You know, as good as I can be under the circumstances. Okay. How are okay. you? Uh, doing well, taking care of my husband. <laughs> Cooking a lot more than I need to, but... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you have to. <laughs> yeah. For which I am very grateful. You should see these meals. They're meatless meals often. Wow. There's something called purple carrot, which uh, provides these beautiful vegetarian meals. May you never find out about them because I actually miss my my beef. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, I'm told it's healthy, so what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. I think meat is the way to go for me. But you should I'll try tell my some sister. of my tofu. Tofu. My sister would she love actually it. can make the tofu sing. I don't know how it happens. But <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> it is, actually. <laughs> well, you have to come eat dinner with us sometime, and I'll serve you one of our sweet and sour tofu or something. <laughs> I would love to. Okay. <laughs> That'd be nice. Uh, that's going to happen. I promise. <laughs> it's nice to see you, Coleman. Great to see Take you, care. too. All right. See you. Okay. Yeah, so uh, City Journal, uh, you and Heather McDonald are colleagues. Yeah. Have you been following what she's been writing about uh, COVID-19? I followed one of her very early pieces um, in which she argued that lockdown was unnecessary in part because really the only people dying from this are going to be the elderly. Um, and I thought that it was dismissive of, or, you know, it gave short shrift to the counter arguments um, but I haven't followed what she's said since then. That was in the very early days of COVID before most of 
you know, the data we have now um, was available. So I'm not sure what, how her views have changed, if at all. Well, she's generally a lot, a lot down skeptic. That's, uh, that's true. And she's uh, been inveighing against what she calls safetyism, which is this kind of fetish about, you know, I'm in Central Park, I'm jogging, you know, we're in the wide open air. Somebody comes toward me without a mask on and I veer 30 yards off my path in order to avoid coming <laughs> close to them yeah. kind of behavior. Right. Uh, which she says is, you know, kind of obsessive and excessive and whatnot. Um, for, for what it's worth, I haven't seen anyone do that. I, I take a walk in the park every day, including uh -huh. Central Park. I haven't seen anyone behave that, um, that in, in such an alarmist fashion. Okay, well, enough about Heather. Uh, I want to get back to you. Now, City Journal, um, a career in journalism, is that, uh, is that what you're uh, veering toward? Where's graduate school in your picture? I'm sorry, but I'm an academic and everybody's supposed to get a PhD in my, <laughs> my view of the world. No, just kidding about that. But what, what are your plans? What are you thinking about? So I'm, I'm writing for City Journal. Um, and I am, I'm working on my podcast. Oh yeah, we should have mentioned that. Conversations yes. with Coleman, that's what you call it, isn't it? Correct. Say more. Um, it's a podcast where I talk to interesting people and try to connect with an audience on ideas that I think are important. And, um, you know, I also, I do music on the side and that's basically the scope of my career right now is that I write, I make podcasts, I make music. He plays the hell out of a jazz trombone, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Your dad must be very proud. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so uh, did Columbia have any kind of ceremony uh, appropriate to uh, seeing you guys commence? They had a pre-recorded YouTube video where they gave some speeches and what amounted to basically a PowerPoint slide with each student's face on it and, you know, their quote. So it was pretty underwhelming, but I, you know, I can't blame Columbia under the, under the circumstances. I think they, they did the best that they could, but it's definitely upsetting to a lot of people that there was no beautiful symbolic in person live ceremony to, to round out the end of the college experience. Yeah. I really feel for you guys. Um, uh, we're, we're planning, I think here at Brown on including the class of 2020 in the um, formal ceremony that we hope will take place a year from now. Mm. Uh, in the class of 2021's commencement proceedings. So people can come back to campus and they can put on their regalia and they can, their parents can come and all of that. But it obviously won't be the same and probably the attendance rate will be down because it requires people traveling from far and wide. Uh, did you see that uh, my uh, president here um, I got into trouble uh, when she had a piece in the uh, New York Times urging schools to start back again in the fall, saying that uh, that it could be done, uh, but that it required uh, careful preparation. Uh, mm. That must have gotten past you. No, no, I didn't see it. I'm trying to think of my president's name. <laughs> Uh, God, this is a, a senior moment. <laughs> <laughs> it, it'll come to me momentarily. <laughs> uh, Chris Paxson, Christina Paxson. <laughs> Thank God I thought of that. <laughs> I love her. She's a wonderful person. I know her well. She's my colleague in the economics profession as well as president of this university. So there's no good reason for me to block on her name. Yeah, she, she had an op-ed uh, in the Times maybe a month ago. And it said, uh, look at uh, universities not opening in the fall is kind of like not acceptable because a lot of places won't make it if they're unable to get back into the swing. Uh, they're just financially not going to be able to make it. Brown has a big endowment and others do. They're better positioned. We are better positioned. 
uh, to manage something like this than a lot of places. But if, uh, as a general matter, universities don't open in the fall, that's going to be a disaster for a great many institutions. Therefore, it's critical to start thinking now about how to do that, um, how to deal with uh, all of the practical matters uh, that, you know, in terms of social distancing, what do you do with large lectures, what do you do in dormitories in terms of living space, what do you do if you have a minor outbreak and, you know, about the testing and the mask and the social distancing and so on, and that that needed to, the planning for that needed to start right now. That, that was the, the gist of her piece. And then, I don't know, maybe two weeks later on the Sunday Times uh, letter section was given over to people commenting on Christina Paxson's uh, op-ed, and they were very, very tough on her, the comments. Mm -hmm. uh, how irresponsible was this to contemplate the idea of opening in the fall um, and so on? Uh, are you putting dollars in the university's financial positions ahead of uh, the safety of their students? And, you know, oh, you shouldn't do that. Um, she took a lot of criticism for that. Uh, what are you thinking about uh, about opening up? Um, well, I I don't have a strong position on it, but I'm I I personally, you know, judging from where I'm at and where the people in my immediate circle are at, my family, my friends, the people I'm talking to, which you know, that set of people is, is skewing younger to begin with, but yeah. it, it seems like a lot of people are ready to open up right now in a stepwise fashion and take calculated risks based on their own individual circumstances that only they are aware of. So like many young people know that, I mean, they're not even particularly young, but many, many people know that they have no immune problems and they know the opportunities they're missing out on by choosing to stay home. And at some point, I think we do have to let people make, you know, take calculated risks based on, based on their own circumstances with, uh, you know, while at the same time placing strong guardrails in public places so that their actions don't, or at least minimally affect the actions of other people that are around. So, you know, separating tables and restaurants, um, but letting them reopen, uh, you know, requiring masks in public. Um, so I, I, I do think I'm very open to that being, an, being sort of on the table at the moment. And I, I think because it's so politicized, um, you know, anyone who I think suggests that, whether it's Heather McDonald or, or your president, risks being perceived, especially if they're already on the left, as, as somehow just, you know, towing some right-wing line. And, you know, I, I, I think increasingly I'm, I'm of that opinion. I'm sorry, of what opinion? Of the opinion that we're ready for a, for a responsible and step step based stage based opening rollout of society once again you know um, you know who danielle allen is no uh, she's a political philosopher uh, at harvard uh, formerly at the institute for advanced study um, a classicist and a contemporary political theorist mm. so you know her First book, I think, is called uh, The World of Prometheus, and it's a study of ancient Athens and how it is that they organized punishment for criminal offenses in, in ancient Athens. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but she's written um, a number of other books about contemporary American uh, politics. She's, she has a beautiful memoir of her cousin. It's called Cuz, and it's the story of the life of Michael Allen, who was her first cousin, who was a drug addict and, you know, guy that got into a lot of trouble and ended up being murdered in Los Angeles and how the family tried to quote unquote save him or help him or relate to him and deal with his problems and how it affected her personally. So she's a wide ranging person. She directs the uh, SRAFA Center for uh, Ethics at Harvard, mm. uh, where she's a university professor. But before that, she had the chair in uh, political theory at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. 
uh, which had been held by Michael Walzer for all those years. Uh, so she's a, and she's an African American. I guess I should have said that she's a very prominent uh, a contemporary uh, political thinker. And she's organized an effort to uh, coordinate across a number of different uh, academic disciplines a reflection on how to deal with the COVID-19 crisis. They came out with a plan. Uh, I couldn't tell you all the details of it, but the main emphasis is on testing, contact tracing, and supported isolation. In fact, I think they call it T. CSI or something like that. They have an acronym for it. Uh, but the, the emphasis is on widespread availability of testing, uh, tracing the context of people who test positive, um, enforcing the isolation of those uh, people who test positive and those who might have been in contact with them for a period of time, and supporting them in that isolation until the, we can get control over the uh, epidemiological uh, dynamic. Anyway, long story short, she uh, writes a regular column for the Washington Post, and this is apropos of your point about how the political partisanship is such that now whatever you might say about this issue is going to be read through a lens of what you know side are you taking? Are you supporting Trump? Do you agree with the concert? You know, the lockdown debate has somehow become captive to the larger political schism. Um, and she had a piece in the Post after the uh, Trump administration uh, put out its kind of transition plan for how to begin to think about opening up this kind of phase, you know, set of criteria for what the state should follow. And she said, I think this is basically the right way to go. She said, it's a reasonable start. That's what she said in her column. The administration's plan, not without its problems, nevertheless, is a reasonable starting place uh, because it emphasized the kind of things that she and her study group had been uh, emphasizing about testing, contact tracing, supported isolation, and so on. Anyway, the response from the readership was viciously negative and personal and to a certain degree racist and sexist. Uh, the people writing into the Post complaining about the fact that the Post would publish a column from a woman who happens to be an African American, who is a left of center, uh, ideologically speaking, uh, person with a, a long track record to that effect, um, who um, is at Harvard uh, uh, and who, uh, on behalf of a collaboration that she has encouraged, announced that the administration's framework is not unreasonable and we should try to build on it. And people savaged her uh, for having done so. And I thought, I could only think, what incentives does that create for other people who might be trying to think about this problem, but then have to put their finger in the wind before they speak because they know that they're going to be tarred and feathered if they say something that seems to be, uh, you know, in keeping with or supportive of uh, positions that uh, this particular administration might be embracing. Yeah, I think there's a there's a huge invisible cost to the the level of polarization we have, and c c the COVID crisis has been unique because normally we just accept the status quo where on abortion and taxes and every issue you can name, gun rights. We just accept the status quo where the moment you utter an opinion on one side or the other, you can't issue a caveat fast enough for one side to, to not completely dismiss you. But with COVID, it, it's, been, it's been interesting to see it progress from an issue that at the beginning, from what I remember, and I wonder if your recollection is the same as mine, was completely nonpartisan as of, say, March 15th. If I remember what the what the discourse on COVID was like, I was looking for for the epidemiologists and the experts, and regardless of what they said, I could not predict their politics their politics on on the basis of it. By two or three weeks later, the the you know the sides had been drawn, um, and I I think it's it's interesting to observe that. I don't think there was anything inevitable about the, you know, how it, how, um, how the, how the sides were, were drawn. I don't think it was at all inevitable that the American right would be 
uh, the anti-lockdown party and the, the left would be the pro-lockdown party. And I'm, I'm, I think about this in particular because I, I, I recently wrote uh, for, for City Journal a very long piece on Thomas Sowell. And on, oh, did you? Has it appeared? It hasn't. It'll be in the, uh, the magazine summer issue. Um, I'm sorry, I take you off a uh, point for a moment, but that is long overdue and very welcome. And I, I'm very excited about it, actually. I look forward to seeing what you do with that topic, uh, because I think he has not been appreciated for, uh, you know, the towering intellect that he actually has been for a half century, not yeah. only with respect to racial questions. I'm not trying to write your piece for you, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very happy to hear about that. Yeah, no, I, I deliberately make a point of not mentioning his opinions on race until probably the last third of the, the very long essay. Excellent. Because I think, you know, his, his book, Knowledge and Decisions, and his exactly. other book, Conflict of Visions, yeah. are very, very deep contributions, uh, great examples of academic writing in the first place, and deep contributions to their particular, you know, uh, domains insofar as I can judge it as a, as a non-economist, but yeah, con conflict divisions is more a political theory book. And you know, the, the reason I bring this up is because so he, he starts off with the observation that um, different groups of people predictably line up on issues that seem on their face to have nothing to do with each other, like gun control and the tax rate and abortion and yeah. education policy. And if you look at that fact as if for the first time and observe how bizarre it is and seek to explain it, um, there, are, there are at least two ways you can explain it. And I think there's truth to both of them. One is that it's pure political partisanship. Um, the content of the issues themselves are arbitrary. You can mix and match them, however. What's important is that humans need to sort themselves into teams as a matter of psychology. And whatever, whatever the opinion is simply becomes a badge of belonging to one tribe or another. Yeah. But Sowell really delves as, as deep as, as one possibly could into the other kind of explanation, which is that there actually is a kind of deep coherence. Uh, and there are almost fundamentally two ways of viewing the world. One he calls the unconstrained vision and, and the other he calls the constrained vision. And the most important difference is that in the, in the unconstrained vision, people look out on the, the scourges and flaws in society and assume that those are a consequence of policies that can be changed. If, human, if we have a crime problem, there's something about our society about our policies, about our prevailing ideas, that if we changed, the crime problem would, would go away or be significant, significantly reduced. Where the people with the constrained vision assume from the start that human nature is, you know, tends more towards selfishness toward that, than, altruism, than altruism and will always be that way and tries to create institutions that take human flaws as as a given that can't be changed and try to nevertheless create desire desirable results um and i think i i think he you know that there's a lot of truth to that to that thesis and at the same time there are certain issues i think where the pure group psychology partisanship element of it explains the explains which which party takes which view better um than than the, the soul thesis so it, like it, it, it's it's interesting that on the issue of abortion it's the right that wags its finger in the le at the left and says you you guys care about freedom more than you care about human life and on the, on the COVID crisis, it's precisely the opposite. It's the left saying, you guys care about freedom more than you care about human life. And it's, it's hard to, as a person who wants to, who, who like craves a, a deep understanding that isn't soiled by partisanship to think about these issues when, when it appears that, that 
the country just cleaves itself in, into two almost arbitrarily sometimes um, in an effort to, to simply mark itself as a member of one tribe or the other. Now, my thought upon listening to you um, recounting Soul's argument uh, from a uh, conflict of visions is maybe something is missing, which is the role played by political entrepreneurs, that is by actors who attempt to foster their own political um, fortunes by framing public issues in a way that they can predict will appeal to one or another element of the polity that can appeal to their prejudices or their you know, their, their predispositions um, so as to foster conflict where it might not otherwise have occurred. Uh, that was an abstract statement. What I mean concretely is where's President Trump and his own discretionary use of the bully pulpit, the tweet, uh, the power of his office, the daily uh, coronavirus briefings, uh, et cetera, in the midst of a political campaign as an actor with his own agenda who might help to help us to understand why it is that right of center sympathy is with opening up and left of center sympathy is with locking down. Um, that to some degree is a reflection of the fact that the president has framed the opening up and the locking down such as he has done and that people are then moved to their respective corners of I'm pro-Trump, I'm anti-Trump. I'm not necessarily blaming Trump himself, although he certainly has to be a part of the, a part of the uh, account that we would give of how it is we find ourselves uh, so divided. It could also in large part be the way people react to Trump. So it's a complex system, but discretionary actions by political leaders on behalf of their own program is what I want to ask you to insert into this um, uh, Sowellian view about um, about American political division. Yeah, um, my my thought upon hearing that is I, I think many people have been worried ever since Trump began campaigning on, you know, partly on the slogan, lock her up. And, um, you know, on with his expressions of admiration for Vladimir Putin, who has been very quick to imprison people he doesn't like. Um, many were worried that he was going to turn out to be a true authoritarian president. Um, and I think if you had, if you had asked someone a year ago, if you had given them a sketch of, of the coronavirus and the main lines of, uh, you know, the, the main distinctions in people's reactions to, to coronavirus, uh, I can imagine the, the commentariat, certainly on the left and the, you know, the anti-Trump commentariat, worrying mainly about Trump's abuse of power and you know, desire to lock down more than is necessary. I think that would have been the central worry. Um, so I think you're, you're right to say that you know, Trump is an agent who has made a decision for whatever reason to take one, probably, I'm curious why you think he, he chose what he did, but probably he wants the economy to be booming, I imagine, because that's good for him, but. Yeah, I think that's clear. I mean, it is good for him, or at least it was good for him. It's, it's history now. Um, and I think he underestimated um, the, uh, you know, horrible, um, evolution of events that was going to uh, transpire. He wasn't alone in that, but I think he definitely did that. I mean, he came out and said, this will be over in a day or two, practically. You know, don't worry about it. The summertime is coming. It's no big deal. It's just like the flu, et cetera, et cetera. We're not going to uh, overreact here. The cure could be worse than the disease, this kind of thing. He was obviously in retrospect, hindsight is twenty twenty, but we can see that was a mistake um, and uh, so on. Um, I think Trump is driven in part by, you know, this visceral reaction to the way that he feels he's being unfairly treated in the press and so on. He picked fights at these uh, daily briefings that he was having. They became a kind of clown show, really, with Trump standing up there uh, uh, badgering and being badgered by 
uh, and reacting to that, that might have made for good reality TV, but it made for very poor governance, in my view. Um, but uh, I mean, the I think the calculus here is basically we can play it safe and probably have many fewer deaths, uh, but at enormous cost to the economy. Or we can play it less safe, which is not to say laissez-faire and everything goes, but it means much less restriction. Uh, the impact on the economy would be positive, uh, but there would be more deaths. Um, and at the end of the day, somebody's got to make that call either de facto or explicitly. It's politically unacceptable and morally unacceptable to say out loud, I'm prepared to sacrifice lives for uh, other interests. But it's also necessary to do that. And I, and I think I'm, that's my claim. My claim is willy nilly, you have to do something. And when you do it, there will be a consequence to that. And among the things you can do, there will be more or fewer lives lost. And the answer to the problem is not minimize the number of lives lost no matter what. That's the wrong answer to the problem. Therefore, you're in a trade off circumstance. And how you sell the nature of that trade off to the public is everything. Um, and I think Trump is bumbling his way through trying to sell to the public a trade-off in which, on the margin, more lives would be lost, but more economic benefits would be realized. And you can't say that out loud. Yeah, I think the, the way that trade-off is framed uh, is, is really important. And, you know, I, I haven't been paying such close attention to the consequences of the economic downturn to have any specifics, but obviously in every economic downturn you you probably find you know uh, mental health deteriorating probably suicides going up yeah um and, and in this case it's it's even worse because from from what i understand domestic violence has gone up because people are stuck at home with you know, in in potentially abusive situations that were perhaps more manageable before you have to be around the person all the time. And so I, I really don't see how you can simply dismiss the trade-off or act as if a trade-off doesn't exist. And, you know, I'm hearing one of, one of Sowell's mantras in my head, which is there are no solutions, only trade-offs. It's, ver it's very much an economist way of thinking. Um, and I think it's, it's no accident that, that you're thinking that way, but um, yeah, I, I definitely, I, I just worry that in the rush to simply dismiss people as cruel human beings for, for having a, a different view of that trade-off that ultimately we could look back on this in 10 years and, and say we messed up seriously because we, we, didn't, we didn't allow people to think through the issue. Here's another, I agree with that. I think that's a real possibility that a retrospective consideration of this historical moment will find that we blundered badly in the path that we've found ourselves following. I don't know that to be the case. I say it's a possibility. Another thing I wanted to mention is, uh, and I've been thinking a lot about this, um, my mantra, and when I'm talking about this issue with my wife, Luan, is be careful what you do because you may have a hard time stopping to do it. Mm. Okay, so we're all going to wear masks now. And we're going to wear masks forever. Please, me, please believe me, I am not advocating to not wear your mask, okay? We are in the midst of a pandemic. I'll wear my mask, you wear your mask, we'll be okay. Here's what I'm saying. Wearing masks as a way of life going forward is a profound change of the nature of our social interactions. Mm. We present ourselves to each other masked in public. That's a very significant thing as a way of life. It may be necessary in a moment, but to do that as a way of life is, a, is, is something that we at least ought to stop and think about before we just go on down that path. But once we've stepped onto that path, we may have a hard time stepping off of it. Just like we're gonna have a hard time relaxing the security regime that we use for air travel, and maybe we never should, or maybe we should. Maybe the nature of the objective threat will evolve to such an extent that at some point, the cost of the severe security regime that we use to screen people going on the airplanes will not be worth the candle. 
but we're never going to be able to stop doing it because no one wants to be in the position retrospectively of having stopped doing it and then something happens and they get blamed. This argument, you have blood on your hands, is seductively attractive to the political partisan, but it could be profoundly disruptive and destructive of collective reason because no one wants to be accused of having blood on their hands. And hence, they don't want to take any decision which, if it turned out to have been the wrong decision and cost human lives, leaves them susceptible to being charged with having blood on their hands. So the cautious, hyper-cautious, overly cautious regime of safety may be a stable equilibrium politically because political actors take too great a risk to their reputations and to their career futures by departing from it there's safety in the herd. I'm doing what everybody else is doing. I don't want to be the one person to deviate and then have that blow up in my face, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, I, I especially take your point about the masks. Um, you know, on, on one level, it would seem like masks are different than something like the TSA because they're so easy to, to, to take off, literally. Whereas when you have the whole institutional inertia of a security regime, it requires more than an individual's decision to take it off or to roll it back. But on the other hand, there are, there are you know, nations around the world, I'm thinking of, of East Asia in particular, where, where mask wearing is completely normal in public. And I, haven't, I hadn't thought about it until now, but I, I have to imagine that the SARS uh, ep, uh, uh, pan, the SARS breakout in the early 2000s must have been the, the cause of that. Um, I could be wrong about that, and I'm, I'm, I would want to know more. But if that's true, then you know the SARS outbreak led people to be wearing masks 15 years later. So it, it's definitely imaginable that the coronavirus outbreak, you know, that my that my children could be wearing masks in public because of the coronavirus outbreak. Um, and it it is also true that 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 very much changes the nature of social interaction uh, when you can't see anything but a person's eyes. Um, everyone looks you just you can't read people in public actually, and by default everyone looks a bit more menacing. Um, at the same time, I'm I'm always I'm always astounded by how humans can adapt to new circumstances. And in circumstances that seem really strange uh, at the beginning, so it, it's possible that a mask-wearing populace would adapt new social norms that y you and I couldn't possibly predict from our standpoint. That would make it, you know, on, on the level of societal well-being, uh, very comparable to what it was before. Yeah, here's a study that I'd love to see some soci sociologists or social psychologists do, which would be to observe people in their interactions with each other, with and without mask, and to see whether or not the subtle cues that are communicated non-verbally through facial expression and uh, whatnot are uh, discernibly different in the one situation than in the other. For example, if I'm in a society where people are pretty much universally masked, do strangers, when they pass each other on the street, make eye contact less frequently? What's the point in looking over at this menacing and masked person? I actually don't know who it is that's behind the mask. I'm, I'm in my world, they're in their world. I make this up. I don't know if it's true or not. I just say I'd like to know whether um, observational study could uh, inform us about the consequences for subtle social interaction amongst uh, people who don't know each other. Uh, in public places of them being masked. I don't know. I, my fear is that it would somehow degrade the quality of social interaction and make spontaneous intercourse between people. I'm talking about the exchange, social exchange, spoken word, uh, uh, the, uh, the amount of attention I pay to the other party who's in my presence could somehow um, adversely affect that. Yeah. What do you make? Uh, I think we probably should wind down in a few minutes uh, here. Um, uh, what do you make of the racial disparities you write about race? Is that your beat? I should have asked you this first. 
do you have a beat at the city journal and uh, is the racial issue or issues, are they a part of that beat? Yes, they are. Uh, We'll see what I, you know, the totality of what I end up writing about, but I've paid a lot of attention to the issue of race in America and what people think about it and how it's discussed and what the consequences are. It's an, it's an issue where I feel the, the, the tenor of the discourse is deeply often, often deeply misguided where, where smart people are often misled um, where we've lost any sense that, uh, that we are all the same beneath the skin where that, that value rings hollow. And that's something I care about. And it's something I plan to keep writing about in particular, because I feel, you know, where there is, I find a new person beating the drum of race consciousness, you know, every week. I, I know, I feel I, I can count on two hands, um, the people and especially the black people who are giving a different perspective. Uh, and so I feel that, I feel compelled to write about it because, because I care about it. Um, so yeah, that, that'll be part of my beat. And Raihan and company give a green light to that. Yes. I think, I think Raihan had, had read what I, what I wrote about it and found a lot to agree with. Yeah. What are you making then of the discussion about racial disparities with respect to the incidents of COVID-19? So, I, I, I think that there is a deep, there is a deep assumption that, that is mistaken, that disparities are indicative of some kind of systemic bias. And I do feel like a broken record pushing back against this point because it, it, you know, Thomas Sowell has spent his his whole career, of course, I think pretty persuasively um, arguing against this. Yeah, and it it basically is it comes down to a case of coverage bias, which is to say, virtually every disparity at this point, whether it's in maternal mortality, or um, likelihood of working in a service sector, or wealth, or incarceration between Black Americans and White Americans will at some, some point end up, uh, you know, in a New York Times op-ed or, or you know, somewhere else that may, many people will see it and completely understandably say, what is going on here? Why can't, we get, what, why can't we get different groups of people having equal outcomes? That seems, you know, just instinctively, that's, there's, it seems like there should be something we can do or some way in which we're failing if, if we're not doing that. And then... If you go looking, which most people are, are not inclined to do, for disparities between whites and Asians or different sub-ethnic groups of white people, Irish versus Polish versus Italians, Jews, Catholics, you, you find disparities that are often just the same. Yeah. And, but the truth is almost nobody looks for these disparities. So it's, it's as good as you know, they might as well not be there. And of course, one reason for that is, is the, the perpetual reason that race has all, you know, the issue of race has always been special for blacks and whites, as opposed to say different white ethnic groups, which is the very noticeable difference in appearance and skin color and the consequent ease of the special ease of attaching a, a stigma to to black skin and you know the just the visibility of the difference where differences between other groups are you know often less visible and therefore therefore harder to really cement um but in principle you know you i i've spent a lot of time looking at cdc health outcome data for you know, blacks, whites, and Hispanics, and Asians, and you find huge disparities somewhere. Hispanics are, you know, much better off than whites uh, on, you know, death from like obesity related death 
uh, for instance, there are there are you know around ten different kinds of cancer that white people are more likely to die from than than black people, um, and more kinds of cancer that blacks are more likely to die of than whites. But I you know if you zoom in on any one of those disparities, you could make all the same arguments and just flip the races and people would see how I think invalid an argument like that would be. If, if I said, you know, white people are more likely to die of Alzheimer's and um, liver cancer, Th those two things are, are true. And I wrote a, a salacious New York times op-ed trying to tug at people's heartstrings on this issue People, it would just seem confusing to people. It would seem like my analysis was at, at, minim, at minimum superficial. Yeah. And that is the general tone of people talking about COVID race disparities. And I think it is a mistake. Yeah. Um, well, I'm inclined to agree with that. Although um, I can imagine what people are going to say. People are going to say... Um, uh, one thing they're going to say is there's a long history. We're not just talking about contemporary discrimination. So there's the cumulative effect. And even if I don't think the disparity is an indictment of any particular actor, it still might be worth taking into account because it's an indicator of the consequences of a history, which might require us to be responsive to it. I mean, I, I've often thought this actually in, in a little bit in the, uh, uh, distinction to Sol's argument that there's a there's one issue is cause, and then the other issue is 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 uh, policy. If the question is cause, then the um, fact of disparity is not uh, itself proof of the cause of the disparity being discrimination. So I'm with Thomas Sol so far. But if the question is what should require my attention? Let's take the issue of incarceration. Maybe I should be rethinking the regime of incarceration. I've got a disparity in hand, the black-white disparity in the incidence of incarceration. The superficial argument, it's caused by racism, by white supremacy, and let's, you know, uh, racist police departments, racist courts can be dismissed on Sowellian arguments. But the, the, what I think is deeper and more subtle observation, which is that here we are in the 21st century, we've got a regime of incarceration and its incidence falls very disproportionately by racial lines. And we also have a racial history, regardless of whether or not that history is a direct straight line causal explanation of the disparity. Still, the fact of the disparity together with that history ought to compel us to examine our incarceration regime, not only for blacks, but for everybody. The, the, there are many issues that we can consider. Among them are those where the racial disparities are very pronounced. Perhaps those issues should come to the head of the queue of our consideration in light of our history, and maybe even given our uncertainty about causation, not because directly we think that we are responding to discrimination when we deal with those issues, but in some broader sense, we think that the allocation of our attention across all the many competing issues that it could go to should place a priority upon those issues where these disparities are great in like light of our history. Does that make any sense to you? Yes, it does. Um, and I would add to it, if I were trying to make it strong, even stronger, that, that regardless of, you know, regardless of what, what, ha what is true at a, as a matter of cause and effect, given that people do have an inclination towards a, group identity and given yeah. that humans are deeply comparative animals they compare their status to others to other groups we have always been this way and always will be it can it, you can you can find a reason to care about disparity simply s simply by observing how important it is for, for humans to feel like they are equal in society it, it is it is not something that one can simply dismiss. Um, at the same time, we have to acknowledge, I think, two things. One, one is that equality of outcome is impossible. True equality of outcome is impossible, I think. I don't think it can be done um, as a matter of public policy across the board. 
Uh, and secondly, I think often as things become more equal, sometimes people become more outraged by the remaining inequalities. So I'm thinking, for example, of maternal mortality. A hundred years ago, the difference between the likelihood of a black mother dying in childbirth and a black, uh, a white woman dying in childbirth was quite large. Yeah. Um, and that would legitimately, there were public, public policy measures that, that could have plausibly um, reduced that. Um, at the same time, it's, it's also true that, you know, the progress we've made on that front is absolutely astounding in the past century. And right now we're at the point where I, I believe it's true to say that over 99.99% of mothers survive childbirth in good health of blacks and whites. I believe that's true. And you can find a, a, a disparity in the third decimal point, which is a disparity of, you know, it's like a threefold disparity, right? Like black mothers are something like three, three times more likely to die than white mothers. And framed that way, I can totally understand how a person would say, this is a huge problem, three times more likely? Yeah, but when in fact, it's out, much less of a problem than it used to be. Right, and you zoom out and look at the past hundred years, we're talking about one of the greatest human achievements that, that we've, you know, we've almost completely eliminated this problem. And I, I, what I worry is that if people aren't sufficiently educated on you know, what conclusions you can and can't draw from the mere existence of a disparity, what we're going to see is that no matter how much inequality we eradicate, the level of anger about the remaining inequalities is, is going to at minimum remain constant and possibly increase. Yeah. Well, listen, I think we should terminate our conversation since we have other commitments uh, and the hour is late, but uh, very good to have you back at the Glenn Show, Coleman. I look forward to uh, a conversation with Coleman on your platform one of these days once I do something that uh, uh, deserves that honor. <laughs> yes. How is, is, is your memoir coming along? Uh, it is coming along. I'm back. I'm back into the throes of it, actually, because okay. classes are over and there's nothing else to do here. <laughs> and I'm looking at the blank screen and I'm saying, man, you have to justify yourself because the world is waiting. Do it, so, man. yeah, I'm, do I'm, I'm, I'm back at it. I'm dealing with changing my mind about religion and about politics mm -hmm. and about race. Mm -hmm. And uh, recalling my coming up in Chicago, my mm -hmm. fantastic experience getting an education at MIT. Mm -hmm. Uh, my flying too close to the sun in the 1980s when I was a Reagan conservative and then everything blew up in my face. My putting the pieces back together again of my life, drug addiction, stuff like that. So yeah, it's a rich tableau and I'm into it, Coleman. <laughs> Beautiful. I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. Coleman Hughes, a uh, recent graduate of Columbia University, BA in philosophy. Uh, Coleman Hughes, writing for uh, City Journal. Coleman Hughes, uh, who is the uh, proprietor of a podcast, Conversations with Coleman, and who has been my guest here at The Glenn Show. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Glenn.